Mike Porter is going to give us a less cheerful perspective, perhaps. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I when I designed this talk, I thought I was going to be the most pessimistic, but maybe not. <laughs> uh, and also, um, I'm at the end, uh, and a lot of what I'm going to say you've already heard before. Um, so, but it may be packaged uh, slightly differently. So. Uh, the earlier, early skeptical beliefs uh, in the 1990s on the prospects uh, for EMU by the American economists Milton Friedman, Anna Schwartz, who I worked with for 40 years, and Marty Feldstein may still hold true. Uh, EMU, uh, the Euro and ECB represented a grand vision to complete European integration. Having one money and one central bank would avoid the problems uh, pegged exchange rates that plagued the EMS and earlier arrangements and satisfied the strong opposition to floating by France and other European countries. So uh, EMU went forward with a, despite the skepticism by many prominent economists in the US and also in the UK that it violated the optimum currency era criterion. It, it didn't have labor mobility, uh, it didn't have a common fiscal authority to iron out asymmetric shocks. Indeed, Marty Feldstein predicted that it would eventually blow apart and possibly lead to war. Um, and then the proponents of the EMU, in some are in this room, argued that the integration of financial markets would lead uh, to the creation of uh, private insurance mechanisms as a substitute for fiscal union. Um, it was also believed that the, the no bailout clause from the Maastricht Treaty and the stability and growth pact fiscal limits on member nations would work to contain fiscal contagion. And uh, finally, it was believed that reforms in the member states would make labor markets more flexible and that the Eurozone would become like successful national monetary unions such as the United States, Canada, Australia, and Germany. So I, uh, basically, I, I, I give a, I'm going to give you a brief review of the historical lessons from earlier monetary unions, which I, th which I think are still relevant for ascertaining the prospects for the Eurozone's future, although a lot of what I'm going to say has been said before by Hugh and by, by Dick Sill and by other people. Um, so first, let's look at the history of monetary unions. What does it tell us? about the evolution of the Eurozone so far. I'm the only one so far that's talking about monetary unions in this <laughs> panel. Uh, um, and my work with Lars over here uh, over a decade ago uh, on the history of, of monetary unions, we distinguished between national and international monetary unions. And, and, and Jerry Cohn talked about international monetary unions uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the session. And we found, Lars and I found, that national monetary unions predicated on political unification and fiscal union were in most cases successful. By contrast, we found that international monetary unions involving much looser political ties broke down in the face of global stress. And we were thinking mainly about the historical examples that uh, Jerry talked about. And the key, um, the key determinant of uh, of success was the common of, of success of national monetary unions was the common belief by the founding member states in the creation of an overarching national or federal state. And it was often driven uh, by the motivation of a common defense against a common enemy. For example, in the US case it was Great Britain. In the Canadian case it was the United States. I mean most of you don't know that, but that the, the Canadians still think of the U.S. like that a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, and we argued before, before the, it actually began, so we wrote before the EMU got going, that it, it, we thought it would, we were a bit optimistic, we thought it seemed closer to a national than an international monetary union, but that its success would ultimately depend on political will. So let's look at some history. So uh, again, this is repeating a lot of stuff that was said earlier. So thinking of the formation of the United States as a template for EMU. And there's a huge literature on the creation of a monetary and fiscal union as a template for the Eurozone, as the US is, as a good possibility. So I'm just going to do a, a quick 
overview, uh, leaving out some of the good details that John Wallace gave us. So the Confederation period after the American Revolution has, has a lot of resonance for the Eurozone case. Uh, despite the unifying <coughs> belief among the 13 states in independence from Britain, the Confederation broke down because the Congress had virtually no taxing power, no common currency, and no monetary authority. Indeed, the states, issuing their own currencies, engaged in self-destructive competitive um, devaluations. And so the Constitution of 1787 solved many of these problems um, uh, by giving uh, the Congress exclusive authority over the currency and making the dollar convertible into specie and also gave the federal government um, considerable fiscal authority with tariffs and excise taxes. And also the Free Commerce Clause set the stage for a common market. Now Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury, played a crucial role in laying the foundations of the U.S. Fiscal and Monetary Union, although some elements of his stabilization package of 1790 did not last. Uh, the, the, the first national bank didn't last, and then the second bank. Um, the early fiscal, fiscal union was, was very rudimentary. The federal government had limited power over national defense and public works, but no transfer power. And Hamilton created a national bond by, by consolidating the state's debts uh, and was serviced by customs revenues. So unlike the Eurozone, um, there were th it, was, it was based on, on a national tax. And also a prototypical central bank, the first bank of the United States. Uh, the U.S. also developed a no bailout clause which became effective after uh, eight states were allowed to default in 1841 and that no bailout clause still endures. But true, true fiscal union, fiscal federal didn't, didn't come until the, until the Great Depression. Um, with the New Deal during the Great Depression in the 1930s, when the regional shocks <coughs> were too great <coughs> to be overcome by market forces and individual uh, states' revenues. The U.S. Monetary Union was slow to get going. The Constitution created a currency union based on specie, um, but not a monetary union. Um, because the states had, uh, had control of, 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 bank, of banking. Um, and so before the Civil War, <coughs> we had these banknotes, state banknotes, circulating at varying discounts. So we, didn't have a, we did not have a uniform uh, fidu fiduciary money system. And the attempts by the first and second banks to police the state banks and create a uniform national currency were short-lived. <coughs> and moreover, the U.S. Monetary Union was temporarily broken during the Civil War over the issues of slavery and the tariff, and political will broke down. Uh, full monetary union came with the national banking system in 1865, which created a fully uniform currency, both of specie coins and fiduciary money with bank deposits convertible into currency. The U.S. did not have a, a central bank after the demise of the second bank of the United States until, until the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913. So the U.S. took over a century to develop a full-fledged monetary union and a fiscal union even longer. How is the Eurozone doing compared to the U.S.? and other successful national monetary unions experience. So these are some metrics of, of how the U.S. Uh, is, how, how the Eurozone is doing. So uh, EMU in 1999 created a full-fledged monetary union with a central bank, and they did it in much less time than it took the U.S. But the fundamental economic conditions that make in a monetary union successful are still largely absent. Integration of the real economy, goods, labor, and financial markets, which lies at the heart of a currency area, has been much slower than in the U.S. case. Uh, a banking union, in the sense of a monetary union-wide banking supervision and regulatory authority, has been slow to evolve in the Eurozone. In the U.S., uh, federal regulation and supervision uh, with the exception of the, of the, of the, two, the de facto powers of the, of the two banks of the United States. That only really began in 1865 
with the creation of the national banking system. But the U.S. had a dual banking system, state and federal, with competing regulatory claims. And it's only since the Great Depression and FDIC and the advent of FDIC have you had a successful nationwide crisis resolution mechanism in place, at least until the subprime <coughs> crisis. Um, the Eurozone has also been less successful than the U.S. and other national monetary unions in clearing regional imbalances. The interregional balance of payments mechanism worked quite well in the U.S. since the 19th century, reflecting factor in goods market integration. The Eurozone has huge imbalances. The one-size-fits-all monetary policy also tends to work well in the U.S. <coughs> and other national monetary unions like Canada compared to the Eurozone, again, reflecting greater integration. The Eurozone has always exhibited lower growth, economic growth in the United States and the other national monetary unions, which makes the problem uh, worse. This is a point that Harold and I made in a paper uh, in 2009 on, on the anniversary of the Euro at 10. And we, we, we raised the issue of banking union, fiscal union, the whole, the whole nine yards. And we were the only paper at this conference that was, that was negative. And we got dumped on. Okay, but then five years later, it seems like maybe we had something to say. Um, also, uh, <coughs> the crisis of 2007 and 2007 to 2008 is an example of the type of global shock that many of the Eurosceptics predicted would reveal the underlying fault lines of the Eurozone. So, in a sense, the ECB did better than the Fed did in the 1930s in attenuating the recent crisis. So the, the, in the first couple of years, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Eurozone was doing a lot better. Um, uh, and, but what didn't happen is in, in the U.S., we did, the U.S. did create fiscal federalism with considerable fiscal ca capacity at the center and extensive fiscal transfers. Um, and this is not apparent in Europe, nor do we have nor does Europe have a euro bond, like Hamilton's national bond. Um, so that didn't happen. And probably the worst failing is the revealed hollowness of the no bailout clause. So what are the lessons from history? Well, the lesson I take from it is political will has kept the EMU project going despite its shortcomings. Okay. Many of the big flaws that were recognized over a decade ago, ago by the Eurosceptics still need to be overcome. Will the Eurozone in its present state survive? Um, from the vantage point of the spring of 2013, the outlook does not seem terribly encouraging. If it does survive intact, it will be largely because of political will. And if it does prevail and political will does not evaporate, then the long-term outlook will likely be one of continuing muddling through its turmoils and ongoing slow growth and relative global decline. So I end on a kind of gloomy note. Thank you. <coughs> Very good. <coughs>